Say something. Oh, Say something. Oh, there it is. Hello? I can hear him because I'm standing right next to him. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> that's good enough. That's good enough. Okay. All right. Uh, that's what you heard. Your family over here. That's <laughs> what you heard. Ready, Caleb? Okay. That's what you are. Just the last song? But they just heard the last song. How about do the first song? That's good. They, they, they should. No, but we should.
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to CIBC. I am very glad to see you. I'm very glad to be here. This is uh, my first time um, leading up here to real people uh, in, what, uh, 15 months or so? And I'm just not used to seeing people without a square around them. It's, it's very odd. And, and I'm used to usually be able to make a mistake and then stop the recording and all that. So I apologize if this service goes weird. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess things up right now already by, by letting you know that offering, we have offering. And that offering is there's a box back there, I was told. And at home, you can do offering um, online through the QR code or through the website. Um, and uh, you know, me being here um, uh, and seeing all the changes, there, there's so many different things going on. Um, yesterday, I came here um, to do some things um, with uh, VBS. And then I came to check out the cajon. And I noticed there's, the cajon is all weird and all set up funny. And, and everything is set up funny. There's this shield here, and, and everything is different. And um, I, I think when, when there's, there's a lot of things that changes, it, it makes people nervous, like me. And it might with you as well, as we encounter changes in our lives and, and changes um, even as we transition back into church. So I'm, I'm reminded of this verse um, in Malachi, Malachi 3, 6. It says, for I the Lord does not change, so that you, O children of Jacob, will not be consumed. Uh, changes can really be, be very consuming at times. It, it consumes our minds, our, our, our emotions, um, our, and um, as we come this morning, I'm just so glad that we can rely on the faithfulness of God, um, His goodness, um, his, his omnipotence, and uh, that He's always there. And as we begin this uh, day of worship, let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for uh, bringing us here. Thank you, Lord, that as when the world changes around us, we thank you, Lord, that we can rely on you, that you never change. You have created this world, and even though people change, situations change, and, and the whole entire society and world changes, but you never change. We can rely on you. We thank you, Lord, for that. Please be with us as we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and worship with us.
faultlessly stand before your throne because of your sacrifice. Father, we thank you, Lord, that through the storms of life, that we can still trust you, that we can still depend on you. Father, we pray that you may just, um, just strengthen us so that we can say yes, that we can um, just trust you even when times are tough. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this time of worship. In Jesus' name. to 
having a mask on and knowing when to take it off. But good morning, everyone. Uh, problem with the mic? Hello, can you guys hear me? I think we'll just uh, we'll just use the podium mic. Thank you to the Mac family for leading us in some wonderful songs this morning. Uh, it is such a joy and a treat to hear everyone singing. Uh, I, I don't know if, you, if you've missed it, but I certainly missed it. And I hope it's not something I will get used to again for a long while. It's so good to hear uh, the voices of God's people lifted up together. Uh, this morning, before we have our pastoral prayer, I do have one important announcement to make. Um, I, Pastor Ed Lee, who I know many of you no, uh, we've, uh, he went home to be with the Lord on Thursday evening this past week. Uh, those of you who know, he suffered a very bad fall last week, um, and there was uh, pretty severe brain damage, and uh, we, we just found out he went home to be with the Lord. Uh, I didn't get the pleasure of meeting him, but I know he is someone who has had a great impact at CIBC and in the lives of many people here. So I know he will be missed. And even beyond CIBC, um, some pastor friends of mine in the, in the Bay Area, they all mentioned his passing with great sadness. So uh, it is sad, but we know that he is in the joy of the Lord. Um, we will let you know any information that comes up about a celebration of life service. In the meantime, please continue to pray for his family, his wife, Alice, his daughter, Melissa, and his son, Matt, as well as their families. So uh, with that, it is, I know it is sad news, but it is more important than ever uh, for us as we remember when we hear news like this, the joy and the hope that we have in Christ and uh, that is secured for us through Christ and promised to us in his word. So with that, let us uh, pray for, uh, for Ed and his family, but also for our time in God's word today. Heavenly Father, Lord, it is with heavy hearts that we mourn the loss of uh, Pastor Ed Lee. Lord, we know that uh, it is never easy when someone who has had such a great impact for you on this earth is taken home, and we will miss him greatly. Even those of us who have never met him, we have been impacted by those that he has reached. And we know that uh, Lord, that uh, we take comfort in the fact that he is with you and he is free from pain and he is in the presence of his Savior. And so, Lord, while we are saddened by his loss and we are saddened by the time of separation here on this earth, we look forward to the day when we will be reunited. Lord, in the meantime, we pray for his family. We pray for his wife and his, uh, his children, Lord, as they... Uh, not only mourn the loss of their, their father and husband, but also, Lord, have to deal with the planning uh, of, of all the different um, uh, services and, uh, and things to take care of. So, Lord, we just pray that you will be with them. You will comfort them. You will bring healing to them, Lord, and you will give them wisdom going forward. Lord, as we turn to your word today and as we focus on Christ Lord, even after hearing such tragic news, Lord, it is a reminder Lord, that though we mourn and we weep as Christians here on this earth, our mourning and weeping is finite. There will be a day when we will see Christ face to face, when we will be reunited with our loved ones, those who are in Christ. So, Lord, today as we continue in the book of Colossians to look at the ramifications of what it means to be in Christ, may we be reminded that this has an impact for us well beyond this life and into eternity. Lord, I pray that as we study your word, it would not just be to benefit us here, but it would be to prepare us for heaven. It would be to prepare us to, for the day when each of us will see you face to face. So Lord, I pray for you to be with us as we study your word. I pray for your wisdom, and most of all, I pray for tender hearts that will be impacted and transformed and renewed by your word. 
So it is in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, as we continue our study in the book of Colossians, we are in Colossians chapter 3 again today. So if you, will, uh, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there. Now, there is a, a saying um, that, that says, uh, clothes makes the man. And it's talking about the fact that how you dress can greatly impact the way you feel about yourself, the way you carry yourself, and especially the type of situations you may find yourself in. And I am just remembering now that today I am trying to control my PowerPoint for the first time. So, <laughs> so a lot of firsts, so you, I, I pray that you will bear with me. But uh, if it's true that clothes make the man, then I truly have to wonder what uh, this person was thinking when he met the Queen of England. Now, this is the actor Paul Hogan, uh, who played Crocodile Dundee, and I understand it that he was supposedly dressed as his character, but uh, you look at that picture and you just think, wow, this guy is out of place. Uh, Does he know who he's meeting with? You're you're meeting with royalty. Uh, You probably shouldn't be wearing shorts and a a cut-off shirt like that. Um, But especially for some of our students um, who may have attended graduations recently, we know that uh, for certain situations, you need to dress the part. Uh, For graduates, no matter what you may wear underneath, you have to have your robe on. Otherwise, they're not going to allow you to walk across the stage. Um, And many of us, we we may have nightmare scenarios where uh, we, we, we dream that we show up to work or school or some other important function uh, wearing only our underwear or our pajamas, and that is the stuff of nightmares. And even in the time of Zoom, at the very least, when you attend a Zoom meeting, you need to wear something appropriate on top. You may still be dressed in your pajama bottoms, but you should probably be wearing a respectable-looking shirt <laughs> when you attend a meeting on Zoom. Uh, we understand this idea of being dressed for the right occasion and how horrifying it can be if you're dressed for the wrong occasion. Um, But spiritually, if you think about yourself spiritually, are you running around in rags? Have you thought about how you are, quote unquote, dressed spiritually? You see, in our lives, even as Christians, a lot of times sin or conflict or busyness can spread us so thin that our relationship with Christ can feel very meager and inadequate. And and many times, we we try to put on a brave face. We try to uh, put on our spiritual mask when we come to church, when we know we have to see other believers. And we feel so inadequate inside because we know, perhaps spiritually, we're not as well-dressed or appropriately dressed as we ought to be, even though we may be impeccably dressed when we come to church. And as we look at our passage for today, which is in uh, Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17, what Paul is telling the Colossians is that they need to be dressed correctly and dressed appropriately as a child of God, as a citizen of heaven. And that is what he means when he says to be dressed or put on the new self, put on Christ. But for Christians, it is so much more than merely outward coverings. We need to be dressed in Christ from the inside out. And that is the title of today's message. So uh, without further ado, if you will go ahead, you can turn to Colossians three twelve to 17 and uh, follow along as I read today's passage. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything 
in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, what Paul is talking about in this passage from 12 to 17 is basically he is going into detail about something he said in verse 10. Now, verse 10 says, You have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. So the whole idea is, as Christians, there's this big theological concept that we are renewed, we are transformed, we are new creatures in Christ, and we need to put on this new self. That is a big concept. But now he's talking about practically what does that mean? What does it mean when, as a believer, you put on this new self? Well, as the title of today's sermon kind of shows, it's really talking about putting on Christ. And we see a little bit of that at the end of verse 10 when he says, this new self is renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. As Christians, we are always to pursue being like Christ. And that is well and good, but today... What I want to show you from these passages is two ways that you can know that you are putting on the new self. Right? I find that when, when I read a lot of these um, deep Bible concepts, such as being, uh, putting on the new self or putting on Christ, a lot of times I, may, I have trouble like, uh, uh, you know, seeing how that applies to my actual life. Well, what does it mean to put on Christ? You know, does it mean I wear a bracelet that says WWJD? You know, what would Jesus do? What does it mean? And, and that's why passages like today's passage is so important because Paul always gives us the practical as well as the theological. So very simply, the first way that you can know you are putting on the new self is you put Christ on. You put Christ on. And we see this in verses 12 to 14. And a few thoughts here. Number one, the way you put Christ on is, is you, number one, you embrace your Christ-given role. You embrace your Christ-given role. And we see at the beginning of verse 12 that he says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. In other words, he's saying, because that is what you are. You are God's chosen ones. You are holy and beloved. Therefore, you can put on all of these qualities that I have, uh, that he will go, go on to, to list. He's basically reminding the Colossians, as well as reminding us, that this is who you were called and saved to be. This is what God saved you to be, to be chosen by the grace of God, to reflect the holiness of God in your, uh, in your character, and to, to know that you are in the love of God. You are beloved. So before there's a big list of things you are to do, there is a reminder of who you are in Christ. And that is absolutely vital. It's a reminder that all of these glorious things are from God, and they have absolutely nothing to do with with you. God didn't choose you because of any inherent goodness you already have or any uh, good character traits or any abilities. It is purely by his grace out of his abundant love for us. So even though we are called to holiness, he doesn't ask us to be holy before he has chosen us. This is our starting point. And remember, you need to know your role before you can dress appropriately for it. Whether you're a soldier, a gardener, a student, or a businessman, you need to know what your role is before you can dress the part. And that's what he's doing here. And this is a uh, reinforced, we see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and wholeness. So again, it's that reminder that this new self is a reflection of God. God and ultimately of Christ. So to, to put Christ on, you embrace your Christ-given role first. Number two, you embrace Christ-like relationships. You embrace Christ-like relationships. I'm always uh, perhaps convicted as I am reminded over and over in Scripture how closely the, the author of Scripture relates you know, being in Christ with 
our relationship with others, especially our relationship with other believers. I think that's an aspect we often tend to neglect. We often think, oh, well, to be in Christ, that means we need to, be, we need to do good things, we need to have good character. But when we read the, the text of Scripture, it's so often related to how we uh, interact with one another, other believers. And we see this in verses 13, uh, End of 12 and verse 13, uh, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Now, it's very easy when we see big lists like this to just be like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a bunch of good things, right? We need to put all these things on. But it's important that we take at least a little time to talk through each one of these qualities because they highlight um, certain aspects of Christ that we need to put on. So first of all, the compassionate hearts. When we talk about having a compassionate heart, it's really talking about two things, that having an ability to see the suffering of others, that we're not so wrapped up with our own stuff, our own uh, busyness of life that we, we don't really see or, or hear about the suffering of others. To be compassionate it means to be able to see and sense the suffering of others, to see outside of ourselves. In addition to this ability, compassion also means a willingness to reach out and offer help and comfort. So it's really a mindset where we are looking out, trying to see the needs and the suffering of others so that we can help. And we need both components. When we talk about kindness, this is really talking about our general speech and conduct, the way we conduct ourselves in word and deed. Do we show grace and respect to everyone? Generally, that's the idea of kindness, is a general grace and respect to others, in addition to specific acts of kindness. When we talk about humility, we're talking about our attitude. Biblical humility is the intentional placing of others ahead of ourselves, the elevating of the needs of others above our own. And it is also an intentional willingness to lower ourselves to serve others, as modeled by Jesus Christ. When we speak of meekness, I love a definition of meekness that I've heard. I don't know where it comes from, but meekness is described not as weakness. Meekness is strength under control. It really speaks of self-control. It's an intentional gentleness, not responding in anger or getting defensive, even though we may be justified to do so. It is strength under control. And finally, patience. The biblical idea of patience is found in the word long-suffering, being willing to endure unpleasantness, whether it is caused by others or just natural circumstances, with patience with, uh, for a long time, not quick to anger, able to withhold a hasty response. And in, in this day of social media where we are encouraged to vent, to react, as soon as possible, this is a lost art, really, this, this idea of patience being able to withhold a hasty response. And we see celebrities and individuals get in trouble for it all the time. And so definitely, this is something that we need to take to heart. And the way patience is uh, played out in the context of our church is most usually found in this idea of bearing and forgiving that we see in verse 13. Now, this is very important that we take some time to understand what it means because uh, even from personal experience, I know so many conflicts within the church can be resolved if we truly understood these two concepts of bearing with one another and forgiving one another. So firstly, the idea of bearing is really the idea of putting up with, enduring what you may find annoying or grating or offensive in someone else, but it's not necessarily sin. And as I say that, you're probably, unfortunately, thinking of someone in your mind, maybe someone sitting in the pew next to you. Um, We all have blind spots, and we all offend others, I think, in myriad of ways that we don't even realize. And the biblical concept here is 
If you're able to put up with it, if you're willing to love that other person, then don't say anything. Right? If they chew too loudly, you know, it's okay. Uh, if the way they sit bothers you, if they talk too loudly or too long, it's okay because you're probably doing the same thing to someone else. Right? Are you willing to bear with someone? Um, often in, in counseling situations when I'm speaking to someone and they're just venting and saying, oh, this person is doing this and that, my question would be, are you willing to reach out to that person in love? If you're not, then you probably should hold your tongue. Right? If you're not willing to invest the time to lovingly, emphasis on the lovingly, correct a brother or sister for their good, then it's probably not important enough an issue that you should gripe or complain <laughs> or speak up about it. But again, this is not a, a, in a non-sin situation. Right? Forbearance, a very important aspect of living with one another in the church context. Second aspect is forgiveness. And forgiveness really is a lost art, both in the asking and the receiving of forgiveness. See, if we understand Scripture and what the Bible tells us and what Christ has done for us, Christians ought to be the most forgiving people you will ever meet. But we often are the least in reality and in reputation. See, uh, one thing I appreciate the most about CIBC is its long history. Um, over, you know, a hundred years of faithful uh, ministry, and it's a wonderful thing. But along with that, there's some baggage. Churches with long histories can also have members with long memories. And... Man, church grudges can get really ugly given enough time. And we've all heard unfortunate stories of church splits, church feuds, or people leaving the church in anger. And a lot of that is due to a lack of forgiveness. See, in biblical forgiveness, there are two parts. There's two parts to biblical forgiveness. The first part is unconditional. This is the forgiveness that needs to be given by the offended party. If you are the one being wronged, the biblical weight is actually on you to forgive. If you remember one of the last things Jesus uttered on the cross as he laid, as he, as he hung there dying, he, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he's asking for forgiveness for the very ones who have nailed him to the cross, who are laughing, completely unrepentant. Even if they don't know they are sinning against you, you are to forgive, and you are to ask God to forgive them. If you think of the example of Peter when he comes up to Jesus and he, uh, in Matthew 18, and he says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Right? You kind of, get, kind of get the idea that he was perhaps trying to impress Jesus with his forgiving heart. He's saying, should I forgive him seven times or more? But Jesus kind of turns that back on him. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven times, uh, 490 times. And he's not saying, you know, you, you keep a tally, I've forgiven you, you know, 489, 490, you're done. No, he's saying you keep on forgiving. And the idea is, this brother who's sinning against you is not asking for forgiveness. Right? They're, they're continuing to do the same things over and over. And we are called to forgive. You see, in this aspect, the unconditional forgiveness is more of an attitude of your heart than an act that you uh, bestow on others because they're not necessarily asking for it. And the thing is, when we look at forgiveness in the Bible this is the command that we see the most. It's not a command to ask for forgiveness. It is a command to forgive. And I think it's because the Lord knows how hard it is. That it is not natural in us to keep putting up with the same things over and over. Right? We want to respond. We want them to change or be punished. <laughs> but we are the ones who are called to forgive repeatedly. And that is the weight of Scripture. But there is that second part which is the conditional forgiveness, when forgiveness is sought by the offender. We do see an aspect of this in verses like James 5, 16, where it talks about the need to confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. So there's that very real idea that if you've offended someone, you need to confess. And part of 
genuine confession is asking for forgiveness from the offended party. And of course, if the offended party is a Christian, they also need to forgive you. So there is that transactional conditional part, but the more important part is the unconditional heart attitude of forgiveness that we need to give and have simply because that is the way we were forgiven in Christ. It's always a reminder when there's a call to forgive, Scripture always reminds us, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. It is because of the unconditional grace that we've received that we need to have the same heart for others. And so this section is really summed up in Ephesians 4, 31, 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and uh, slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So to sum up this section of putting Christ on, the last aspect of this is you need to embody Christ-like love. Embody Christ-like love. We see this in verse 14. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And this is just a beautiful picture that Paul paints. It's as if you were, you were uh, you know, putting on all these different articles of clothing, and then you put on your, your cloak or your coat, and you kind of cinch it all up, and it kind of keeps everything together. That is how Christian love, biblical love, works. And that is because... Love is one, one of these traits which will last into eternity. Love will last into eternity. We see this in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, you know, the famous chapter on love. But what it says at the end there, it says, So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. And the implication is that love is something we will have, we will experience, and we will practice into eternity, whereas some of these other qualities may not. There will, there will no longer be a need for faith because when we're with Christ, Christ is in sight. We don't need to have faith because the reality is here. There is no, perhaps no need for forgiveness because there will be no sinning against each other in heaven. There will be no need for that. There will be no need for patience or long-suffering because there will be no suffering in heaven, but there will be love. The people that we are with here on this earth, they are the ones that we will together lovingly worship God for eternity. Love will last into eternity, and love encompasses all of these previous qualities that we talked about. You see, the basic question when we run into a situation where someone offends us isn't necessarily just remember, oh, I need to practice forgiveness, I need to do this and that, but really the question is, do you love this person? Do you love this person the way that Christ has loved you and the way that Christ has loved them with all your faults and failures and with all their faults and failures. And our love motivates all these other qualities. So that is the first aspect of putting on the new self. Are you putting Christ on? Remembering who you are in Christ. Are you embracing Christ-like relationships and are you embodying Christ-like love? Are you putting Christ on? The second way is are you letting Christ in? Is to let Christ in. And that is the second half of our passage. We see, first of all, it, it says, let Christ rule in your heart. Oh, sorry, I think I moved too quickly. Ah, let Christ rule in your heart. Let Christ rule in your heart. See in verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful now, when we talk about the peace of Christ, you may be thinking of something that is very internal and personal, and there's, that's absolutely true. The peace of Christ is internal, first of all. When we come to God through Christ, we have peace with God because of Christ's sacrifice, his payment and atonement for our sins. And because of that, we can have peace in the midst of suffering and tribulation. There's this internal peace that comes from Christ. But what this verse is focusing on is actually a relational peace, peace with others through Christ. It's really talking about how people with the peace of Christ in their hearts, as we all ought to be as Christians, how these kind of people should live with one another. And the answer is we should live peaceably with one another. 
You can't say that you are at peace with God if you are at war with others. See, even as Christians, when we have to divide over issues of sin or fundamental beliefs, right, there are times when we need to enact things like church discipline, when we need to separate from others because they espouse heretical beliefs or they're in gross, unrepentant sin. But even in this, these times, it is to be done peaceably on our parts. We are never to think of ourselves as going against someone or fighting someone, uh, even as, as, uh, as we may condemn their actions or their words. They are not our enemies. They are brothers and sisters to be redeemed and restored and called to repentance. You cannot be at peace with God if you are at war with others. And we see this emphasis again in Romans. Oops. Oh, I forgot to put a verse there, I think. Ah, okay, I skipped a verse, sorry. Romans 12, 11. It says, Finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, Agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. So the question here is, are you ruled by a peace-filled heart, or when you look at around you, do you only see offense and debts to be repaid or grudges to be fulfilled? You know, there's a, there's a, a word that's gained prominence recently. Uh, this is a word of, of being triggered. Right? Uh, we talk about, uh, usually in the context of, uh, oh, someone is easily triggered, they're easily offended, and it's used sometimes derogatorily, um, especially by, you know, often conservatives against liberals. They say, oh, you know, those liberals are so easily triggered and offended, and uh, cancel culture and all that, but I would say we need to examine ourselves, too, because that kind of tendency easily exists within the church as well. We can be so easily triggered by things we see. You know, I've, there's, a, there's a joke that pastors often tell, which is based in truth, that they've heard of churches splitting over the color of the carpet, right? Or, you know, issues as silly sometimes as whether we have pews or chairs. We can be so easily offended and have a unpeaceful and warlike heart. Let Christ rule in your heart, especially the peace of Christ. Number two, how do you let Christ in? Let Christ rule in your worship. See this in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. True worship and fellowship ought to unite us. And true worship and fellowship can never be done alone. Now, obviously, the fellowship part is, is obvious. We can't fellowship if we're alone. But I will say that we can often be in a fellowship and feel very alone, right? Isn't that the case? For, for many, uh, you can be in a group. You can be in a group that is, on the outside, very friendly and loving, but you can, never, you can perhaps go through that and never experience true fellowship. True fellowship involves intimacy and vulnerability and courage, which is why the reminder here is that, you know, as we sing and as we worship, there is also the aspect of teaching and admonishing one another, of correcting and instructing. And that implies we know enough about each other to know what areas we need help in. We're willing to share our weaknesses, our failures, our sins with one another with the understanding that there will be loving correction, right? There's a, a level of trust that it takes to make this happen, and it is only found when Christ rules in our worship. The emphasis there is to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And this idea of the word of Christ is not just talking about necessarily the very words of Jesus. It could, perhaps could be translated as the message of Christ, the message of Christ dwelling in you richly. In other words, the gospel of Christ. Let the gospel of Christ dwell in you richly. The gospel of grace, of forgiveness, of sacrifice for others. Does this permeate our meetings and our worship? That we are gracious to one another. We don't let anyone fall through the cracks. That there is forgiveness. There is sacrificial service to one another. 
Our own time in the Word of God ought to fuel and energize our corporate time together and not the other way around. I think many of us, we look to Sundays as a way to get us through the week, right? I need to get, get my fill on Sundays and be energized, and then I'll make it through the week. But it really ought to be the other way around. The Sundays ought to be the high point of our worship and our study uh, personally throughout the week. And we come together out of our abundance, not out of our lack, even though we know you know, there are times when we need to bear with one another, and we, we can come when we're empty and hurt, but we ought to make it a goal to come and be, be so overflowing and ready to worship. And though we teach and admonish, as this passage says, the Bible is never to be used as a hammer for destruction. The Bible is a scalpel used for healing and restoration. Even though the Word of God, when applied, will often cause us pain and discomfort. It is a pain and discomfort that is akin to surgery, to, to help us get rid of the cancer of sin and to aid in our healing and overall health. It is not to be used as a hammer to tear someone down or to make our point or to, you know, as, you know, as a broadside of a cannon, you know, fired at other people, as so often is the case. And this takes time and devotion. Let Christ rule in your worship. Oh, sorry. And uh, we see this devotion uh, in Acts chapter 6, verse 4. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It was the words of the apostles, the, the, the elders and the, and the apostles at the early church. We need to devote ourselves to this. Finally, let Christ rule in your actions. We see this in our final verse, verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And this is really a summary of everything that Paul has talked about, everything we've studied today. Basically, in everything that you do and say, are you able to say that everything you do and say has been, that you can attribute to the name of Jesus. I'm doing this in the name of Jesus. I'm saying this in the name of Jesus. That is impossible outside of the grace of God. Right? That is a, a, a reminder for us how carefully we ought to act and speak. Can you say that everything you do and say, that you can say, oh yeah, it was done in the name of Jesus. Everything that you do and say, is it something you can thank God for? Right? Giving thanks to God the Father through him in terms of whatever you do in word or deed. Is that something you can say? I know that's usually not the case for me, but that is what the type of mindset we need to have in mind. That whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm saying, I can honestly say I give thanks to God that I was able to say this or do this. Right? That really ought to temper our, our actions and words before others. <clears throat> And we see this in a parallel passage, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. What, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Then that's another way to think about it. Is whatever you say and do, can you say that will bring glory to God? And you know, the, the thing is, the way this is most tested is in our conflicts and disagreements with one another. You know, we can all live harmoniously when we are in agreement. But the true test is when we disagree, especially amongst believers. When we disagree with each other in your words to the brother or sister you disagree with, can you do that in the name of Jesus? Can you give thanks to everything you say to that brother or sister to God? And will your words to that brother or sister bring glory to God? In other words, can we disagree well? I think one mark of being a Christian and being a church that practices is that we disagree well with each other. We, we are loving and peaceable in our disagreement. I love the, uh, the uh, example that uh, Pastor Theron used last week about you know, uh, Chief, uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Scalia and Ginsburg and how they were in dire opposition to each other but closest of friends uh, when it comes to their personal relationship. 
Can we do the same? So in conclusion, true unity is found in Jesus alone. From the very beginning of the church, unity among believers is to be one of the first and greatest signs that we have been transformed and saved by Christ. In other words, that we have put on the new self. And there is perhaps no better time to practice than now in America. This is a very fractious time for America and the church. You know, as I just look around at some of the stuff that people are posting, Christians are posting, I just, it just seems like every aspect of our lives has been weaponized to set us against each other, whether Christians against non-Christians, and even Christians against Christians. There seems to be division in everything. We can divide over the brand of pillows that you buy, the type of fast food that you eat, the stores that you visit, the color of your coffee cups sometimes, uh, the schools you go to, your views on climate change, on vaccines, on masks, on race. If we are only united by our nationality, our politics, our ethnicity, or even just by our life stage, we are going to fail as a church and as individual fellowships. See, when we say we are in Christ, that can not only be a veneer we spread over our prejudices and preferences to justify them. This will only separate us and divide us. We need to be in Christ from the inside out. Only in Christ and through Christ can the church truly be for Christ. And I pray that we will be such a church. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these encouraging and challenging words, Lord. It is encouraging because it is a picture of what we ought to be and what can be if we truly are in Christ from the inside out. And it is a challenge for us because we know so often that is not the case in our own hearts and in the context of our church. But Lord, we know that in Christ there is grace and forgiveness and hope. And so it is with hope that we go forward. I pray that each one of us will take stock of our own hearts and lives, Lord. Help us first and foremost to be people who are in Christ and help us to be a church that is truly in Christ. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Let's uh, respond to God with a couple songs. You're my all in all. Treasure that I see. 
Before our benediction today, I just have a few quick announcements. Number one is that the church office will be closed this Monday in observance of uh, Memorial Day. Uh, number two is just a reminder that uh, you are free to uh, hang out in fellowship outside after service is over, but just remember to clear out of the um, parking lot as soon as possible for the Cantonese congregation who will be coming in. Our benediction today comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> May you walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. We hope you have a great day. Satisfied